I'd like to introduce to you Sister Mary Catherine Hilkert, a professor of theology here at the University of Notre Dame, one of our most distinguished faculty members, someone who's well known to those of us in the homiletics community, particularly for her book, Naming Grace. Uh, she is a Dominican Sister of Peace. You will notice there are a number of Dominicans on the program and with us these days, they're up to something. They're having some sort of <laughs> meeting. So we're delighted that they are here and Kathy will introduce our keynote speaker. Thanks, Mike. It's really a particular joy to be able to introduce my Dominican brother and friend, Timothy Radcliffe, this evening. When Pope Francis described the preacher as one who has a great personal familiarity with the word of God and the preacher's task as the wonderful but difficult task of joining loving hearts, the heart of the Lord, and the heart of the people among whom we preach. He might have been describing the life and ministry of Timothy Radcliffe. Timothy, as you know, was master of the Order of Preachers from 1992 to 2001. And since that time, he's returned to full-time itinerant preaching and teaching and to his home community in Oxford. Timothy was an obvious choice, not just for the Dominican member of the community, of the committee. <laughs> when we talked about a conference for preaching to all the world, since he has spent his life doing just that, at least his life as a Dominican. If you're interested in his unconventional faith journey before that time, in which he describes himself as no pious boy, one of those who used to climb over the wall at the boarding school to go to the pub to smoke and drink, or who was nearly expelled after being caught reading Lady Chatterley's Lover during benediction. <laughs> All the while, convinced of his profound belief in God and that his faith must be central to his life. If you're interested in all that, you can read about it in more detail in the interview that's published in his book, I Call You Friends. But after that young man discovered how and who I was called to be a preacher, he spent his life doing what Dominic himself did, speaking to God and of God. And as Dominic did at an, with an Albigensian innkeeper in the 13th century, Timothy is known for staying up late into the night, listening to the questions of the other, taking their concerns to heart, and sharing his own faith, hope, and questions. Before he was elected provincial of the English province of Dominicans and later master of the order, Timothy taught scripture at Blackfriars College of Oxford, where he was at the same time actively involved in preaching and social justice ministries. When he received that university's highest honorary degree, the Doctor of Divinity in 2003, the chancellor said, among other things, I present a man distinguished both for his eloquence and for his wit, a master theologian who has never disregarded ordinary people, a practical man who believes that religion and the teachings of theology must be constantly applied to the conduct of public life. Timothy is perhaps most well known for the way in which he befriends others genuinely listens and attends to them, especially to those with whom he disagrees. In the order, he's frequently quoted with his famous line, can we chat? His pastoral concern is reflected in the titles of his most widely read books, texts that touch the minds of, and hearts of many students on this campus and throughout the country. Sing a New Song, The Christian Vocation, or I Call You Friends, his book on the seven last words, his books that question, what is the point of being a Christian? 
Why go to church? Why go to church, the drama of the Eucharist? And most recently, taking the plunge, living baptism and confirmation. When asked by that same interviewer about what has sustained him in his preaching vocation over the years, Timothy said, what helped me was I fell in love with study. I discovered that I passionately loved studying the word of God. That, combined with friendship, enabled me to survive. And more than merely survive, I knew I couldn't be happier doing anything else. We're grateful to you, Timothy, for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to your reflections on preaching as conversation in friendship. Good evening. Thank you for the, the warm welcome. You know that we say in England, if they applaud you at the beginning, it's a sign of faith. If they applaud you halfway through, it's a sign of hope. If they applaud you at the end, it's probably a sign of charity. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to be back here in, in Notre Dame. I had a wonderful time here 18 months ago. And I remember learning that when G.K. Chesterton came here, he was very nervous. It was the time of prohibition. And for an awful time, he thought that he would have nothing to drink. But he found that every professor was brewing beer in the basement. <laughs> and the professor of classics made the best beer. <laughs> and it's wonderful this tradition of hospitality has continued today. In fact, I think it was Kathy who was even suggesting that rather than go to the lecture, we should go out to the pub instead. <laughs> it's also wonderful to come back to um, a group. As I look around you, I see so many people that I know, so many people who have been friends at various times in my life, so many brothers and sisters who've taught me so much. I'll just mention Kathy herself, who has taught so much of the order, how to preach. And, of course, our beloved Gustavo Gutierrez. We are all your pupils, Gustavo. So thank you. So we're here to think about... Uh, the new evangelization, I'm not quite sure what's new about it. Anthony Trollope, 19th century English novelist, he said, there is perhaps no greater hardship at present inflicted on humanity in civilized and free countries than the necessity of listening to sermons. <laughs> Even for committed Christians, I think having to listen to preachers can be exquisite torture. There's a friend of mine who's a brilliant teacher, lives in Dublin, and he says that precisely three minutes after he begins to preach, a large and threatening man always stands up and look, points at his watch. <laughs> I expect you'll do the same thing in a couple of minutes' time. But whatever way we preach whether it's in a sermon or whether it's on blogs or tweets or articles or, or web pages, we have to break through a stiff barrier of indifference. I think this is probably even more the case in Europe than it is in the States, which remains a, a deeply religious country. But even here, in the United States, there are a growing number of people who declare themselves uninterested in religion or opposed to it. In Europe, you see these great banners outside the churches, often which say, you know, repent and believe in the gospel. God loves you. He sent his only son to redeem you. But I think that these really mean nothing to anybody unless you already believe. They don't, they don't touch the imagination. 
though I did always enjoy the one which said, would you rather watch with the wise virgins or sleep with the foolish ones? <laughs> I think that's really the, the challenge of evangelization. And I think the most beautiful story about how to do it occurs rather obviously, I'm afraid, in the journey to Emmaus of these disciples, perhaps two, perhaps more, walking to Emmaus with this mysterious stranger, blind to him. And there are two things that change them. First of all, there is the joy. Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road? And secondly, there is the gesture of breaking the bread and sharing it. And I want to start with the joy and eventually lead us to the gesture. You see, the curious thing is that they experience a joy even before they know why. Somehow, their hearts burn even when they've no idea who this guy is. And they're going in the wrong direction. But Jesus doesn't block them. He doesn't stand in the road and say, stop, you should be going back to Jerusalem. He walks with them even when they're going away from the place of revelation. He shares their mistaken journey. But it's the joy that prepares them for the gospel. As it's the joy of John the Baptist who leaps in the womb of his mother even before he can speak, even before he too can see the face of Jesus. This joy is a sort of pre-evangelization. Now, it's not a terrible, hearty, backslapping jollity. You know, smile because Jesus loves you. Personally, I find nothing more depressing. <laughs> so what is this joy? In the Catechizandis Rudibus, St. Augustine said that the teacher should communicate his faith with hilaritas. And that's usually translated as cheerfulness. You know, as if you should crack a few jokes to keep the people awake. I have nothing against that. I do it myself, not always successfully. But hilaritas, for Augustine, means much more than that. It's a sort of exuberance. It's an ecstasy. It's being taken out of yourself. Hilaritas is an experience of grace. It liberates you from self-preoccupation. It's that first encounter with the, with the Lord. And it anticipates our ultimate destiny, which is the joy of God. So it begins in this inarticulate joy and it ends in the silent joy of beholding God. I was very influenced by a, a Sri Lankan Dominican when I was a student who was called Cornelius Ernst. Extraordinary man. His father was Anglican, his mother was Buddhist. And he said that grace is the experience of what he calls the genetic moment. Every genetic moment is mystery, it's dawn, discovery, spring, new birth, coming to the light, awakening, transcendence, liberation, ecstasy, bridal consent, gift, forgiveness, reconciliation, revolution, faith, hope and love. He said it could be said that Christianity is the consecration of the genetic moment. Behold, I make all things new. And this hilaritas, this joy, 
which is the beginning of all evangelization, is a sort of experience of the genetic moment, the abiding novelty of God. And the disciples experience this burning of the heart in conversation with Jesus. And conversation is the typical mode of Christian evangelization. St. Augustine was the greatest preacher, certainly, there ever was in the West. And if you read his sermons, you see that Augustine, he probes people, he questions them, he argues with them, sometimes he sucks. Every conversation of Augustine is a dialogue with his people. So his sermons take off. The preacher and the people ignite each other up. We rub each other up the right way so that one set alight by the faith of the congregation who help one to believe as a preacher. It doesn't always work. I think of one of my English brethren who was called Vincent McNabb in the 1920s when he was preaching at uh, Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. And he had this long argument with a very vociferous woman in the front row of the, of the crowd. And finally she said to him, Oh, Father Vincent, if I was married to you, I'd poison you. <laughs> to which he replied, Madam, if I was married to you, I'd take it. <laughs> Evangelization is not communicating information. It's a happening. It's the happening of grace in which we participate in the happening of redemption, the pregnancy of Mary, that new day on Easter Sunday. And nothing will happen unless it's rooted in conversation, in the to and fro of debate, in the exchange in which we speak and we listen. So that's the first question. Why is conversation at the heart of all evangelization? First of all, because no communication is properly Christian, which does not respect the freedom, the independence, of the person that you're speaking to as your interlocutor. Unless you're open to what they have to say, then it cannot be a Christian conversation. James Allison wrote about what he calls Nuremberg worship, in which the community is reduced to a mob, in which people lose their independence and their individuality. He said, you bring people together, you unite them in worship, you provide regular rhythmic music and marching, you enable them to see lots of people in uniforms, people who've already lost a certain individuality and become symbols. You give them songs to sing. And all this serves to take people out of themselves. The normally restrained become passionate. Unfriendly neighbors find themselves looking at each other anew in the light of the growing Bruderschaft. They get swallowed up into the mob, and every mob can become a lynch mob. On Palm Sunday, they begin by shouting hosannas, and then they end by saying, crucify him. And secondly, evangelization is always conversation because Revelation is God's conversation with his people. In Verbum Dei, Pope Benedict wrote, the novelty of biblical revelation consists in the fact that God becomes known through the dialogue which he desires to have with us. The life of God is the eternal conversation of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And revelation is God's invitation to us to be part of that conversation. 
Herbert McCabe compares it to the, jolly, the, the wonderful joy of a Dublin pub. Benedict again. The word who from the beginning is with God and is God reveals himself in the dialogue of love between the divine persons and invites us to share in that love. So revelation isn't about receiving obscure messages from heaven, you know, tuning in with our radio stations. It's about taking part in a conversation that transforms us and transforms us into friends. Now, any good conversation demands two things which are necessarily in tension, and it's the tension which is at the heart of evangelization. You have to have something to say, and you have to have something to learn. If you've nothing to say, then the conversation's going to be vacuous. And if you've nothing to learn, it's going to be a monologue. Evangelization happens when these are in a right dynamic relationship. So Jesus listens to the disciples on the way to Emmaus, and then he teaches them. So we Christians have a teaching to give. Jesus' title, above all, was rabbi, teacher. And Jesus commands the disciples at the end to go and to teach everything that he's learned from them. Our society, and maybe again, I don't know, maybe I speak really more of Europe, but our society is resistant to doctrine. Because it is a doctrine of the Enlightenment that doctrine is infantile. It suppresses freedom of thought. You could say there is a dogmatic rejection of doctrine. But as G.K. Chesterton once remarked, there are only two kinds of people, those who accept dogmas and know it, and those who accept dogmas and don't know it. Trees have no dogmas, and turnips are singularly broad-minded. <laughs> this prejudice against teaching has so saturated our culture that it's shared by many Christians. Spirituality, we often read, is more acceptable. It's thought to be less oppressive. It's liberating. It gives you calm. It's personal. It's the very object, opposite of Catholic doctrine. But I want to say, and I hope this doesn't sound entirely crazy, that there can be no powerful evangelization unless we recover a sense of the mind-blowing beauty of doctrine. Take, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity. For many Catholics, it's just obscure celestial mathematics, which is absolutely nothing to do with the ordinary challenges of living. But I don't think that we have a hope in hell of sharing our faith unless we rediscover the dizzy excitement, the intellectual liberation of leaving, believing in the divinity of Christ, in the Trinity. Gregory of Nyssa famously wrote in the fourth century, if in this city of Constantinople you ask anyone for change, we will discuss you whether the Son of Man is begotten or unbegotten. If you ask about the quality of bread, you will receive the answer, the Father is greater, the Son is less. If you suggest that a bath is desirable, you will be told there is nothing before the Son was created. I mean, does this happen to you in Walmarts? <laughs> does it happen to you in your communities? I have occasionally suggested to one or two brethren that a bath is desirable, <laughs> but they've never said there's nothing before the sun was created. 
Christianity is an intellectually demanding teaching. It makes you think. It pushes you beyond any easy answers. In fact, it pushes you beyond any answers at all. Vincent McNabb, who I mentioned a moment ago, used to say to our novices in the 1920s, think. Think of anything. But for God's sake, think. <laughs> Brian Davis is one of our brethren, who, a Dominican who teaches at Fordham University. And he was sitting in a bus in London. And he heard two women talking in front of him. And one of them was going on about her, all her troubles and her difficulties. And the other said, well, my dear, you must be philosophical. And the first one said, but what does philosophical mean? And she replied, it means don't think. <laughs> I think our society has largely lost confidence in reasoning which is one reason why we're afraid of doctrine, because we don't know how to engage with it rationally. But Christianity without doctrine would be like steak and kidney pudding without any steak. Or as a character said in Pride and Prejudice, it would be like a bull without any dancing. And we shall only have anything to say to our contemporaries in this conversation if we refuse to dumb down. We have 2,000 years of rigorous thinking and praying about the deepest questions. We have to be loyal to the complexity of things. I was sitting beside a, a lay chaplain in a northern university in England the other day, and we were talking about the Bishop, Bishop of England and Wales who made a statement on gay marriage. And she said, oh, they reduce it just to reproduction. And I said, well, that's not actually true. You know, it's a, it's a nuanced, complex document. And she said, I don't do nuance. <laughs> Truth and justice demand nuance. I can't help telling you about a story about our brother Herbert again. When Herbert was about six years old, he did something very bad, and his mother said to him, John, that was his baptismal name, John, this is so bad that it may even be a mortal sin. And little Herbert replied, Mother, according to the teaching of the Catholic Church, I cannot commit a mortal sin until I attain the age of reason. <laughs> This I have not done at the age of six. Your reasoning is therefore faulty. <laughs> Doctrine keeps alive the drama of Christian life. What Chesterton calls the adventure of orthodoxy. And the young will not in the long term be drawn to a religion which is an innocuous spirituality. You know, light a candle, feel good about yourself, and find where you are on the Enneagram. But if we share with them the challenge of being a Christian, which can involve giving up everything and following Christ, they may run away in terror but they may just find the adventure that they've longed for. You know, in the plane, when I was coming over here, I saw for the first time a, a TV program called Game of Thrones, the Game of Thrones. It's the rage in England. Everybody is watching the Game of Thrones. So I watched it, all part of my preparation for this lecture. <laughs> and it was rather silly. But you could see that it was a drama of love and death, which people want, they thirst for. And if we can present the drama that Christianity is, there might be a chance they prefer it to the Game of Thrones. 
When I was nine, you know, at my little Benedictine prep school, which is what we call the school for little kids, I used to have this dream that the Russians would parachute out of the skies and surround the school. And I'd say, who is willing to die for the faith? And young Radcliffe would hold up his hands and die in a shower of bullets, painlessly, of course, <laughs> and universally admired, which was the main point of it. <laughs> have you ever seen this extraordinary film? I talked about it when I was last at Notre Dame, of gods and men. How many of you have seen it? Great, fantastic. A large number of you. You know, it tells the story of this small community of Trappist monks caught in a rising tide of violence between, on the one hand, the Islamicist terrorists and, on the other hand, the brutal Algerian army. And they have to decide whether to stay or to go. And the youngest monk, Christoph, says at one stage, he says, but I didn't become a monk to die. And the prior says, but you've already given your life away. And finally they realize that they have no option but to stay. And on the 21st of May, people came in the night and took them all away bar two. And a few days later, their heads were found in plastic bags hanging under the eucalyptus trees just under the monastery. I was there in January. When I saw this film in Oxford, nobody wanted to leave the cinema at the end. Nobody wanted to go. Everybody wanted to wait for the last credits. Who did the hair? Who was the best boy? How often does this happen with our sons? People hanging on. Dorothy Sayers said, dogma is the drama. Not beautiful phrases, not comforting sentiments, nor vague aspirations to loving kindness and uplift, nor the promise of something nice after death, but the terrifying assertion that the same God who made the world lived in the world and passed through the grave and gate of death. Show that to the heathen, and they may not believe it, but at least they may realize that here is something that one might be glad to believe. Of course, not everybody will want to hear this in our congregations. Michael Howe, who's a priest of the Orange Diocese in, in California, he said, congregants, which is a new word to me, congregants often want uplifting generalities and heartwarming comfort food. What we really need is somebody like Flannery O'Connor who can shock us into seeing how hard and crucial discipleship is. We can't keep the church alive on comfort food. I was a young friar in the late 60s and it was a time of crisis and many of our brethren left the order. And I think I stayed and many of my generation we stayed because theologians like Herbert McCabe and Cornelius Ernst and Fergus Carr showed us the beauty and the liberation of doctrine. That's what sustains your faith, you know, when the emotional excitement burns low or when the Holy Spirit seems to have taken a break. So that's what we bring to conversation. But there's no, not going to be any conversation unless we also come to learn. It was said of St. Dominic that he understood everything humili cordis intelligentia through the humble intelligence of his heart. I went to Algeria, Algeria many times. I went one month after the death of uh, the monks because our brother Pierre Clavery, who was the Bishop of Oran, was receiving death threats. And Pierre said, J'ai besoin de la vérité de l'autre. I have need of the truth of the other. 
I not only accept that the other is other, a distinct subject with freedom of conscience, but I accept that he or she may possess a part of the truth I don't have, without which my own search for truth cannot be realised. Pierre himself was murdered on the 1st of August with his young Muslim friend, Mohammed Bukichi. And I cannot stress too strongly, it's the main point I want to make, that this dialogue, this conversation, is not the reduction of things to the lowest common denominator. It's not fuzziness. It's the conversation that makes our hearts burn. It's the encounter with the Lord, the stranger on the road. It's the experience of grace, of hilaritas. Pierre Clavery always said that every conversation leads to conversion. And in the first place, to my own. Sin, he said, is the desire to make yourself the centre of the world, the desire to be oneself for oneself on one's own terms, before others and before God, to see everything in terms of oneself. So dialogue, it's a whole moral experience, it's a spiritual experience of being liberated from the narrow confines of the self. We used to have a logician. He belonged to another order. I won't mention which. A bit uh, self-preoccupied. And in the days before there were mobiles, he was wanted on the phone, and everybody rushed around trying to find him. And he was tracked down in the kitchen. And somebody said, oh, there you are. And he said, no, here I am, there you are. (laughs) So dialogue is a deeply liberating moral, spiritual experience of grace. And for this to happen, again, two things are necessary. You've got to get out of your depth, and you've got to discover new words together. At the beginning of the new millennium, John Paul wrote, summoned us, duck in altum, row out into the depths, lose your footing. We've got to have the courage to know that we have to sink or swim. There's no evangelization, paradoxically, unless we are prepared to grapple with questions to which we don't have the answer. Cardinal Casper said the church would have much more authority if she said more often, I don't know. Let me quote the Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard, but doubts and love stick up the world like a mole, like a plough. The very last thing that I did before I got under the bus to go to Heathrow was to interview one of our young friars who wants to make solemn profession. An extremely brilliant, talented young chap. He could be a great theologian. And at the end, after we talked for an hour, he said to me, well, Timothy, what advice do you give me? So I I mentioned three things. The last of which I said was, Get out of your depth. You should always be writing about something which is beyond your grasp. Don't aim to be a master. There's only one master, and that's none of us. And if we get out of our depth, then we'll have to beg for help from other people who don't share our faith. And Dominic wished his brothers to be beggars, not just for bread. Because if people see that we need their truth, j'ai besoin de la vérité de l'autre, if people see that we need their truth, they may be open to ours. If we give them authority, they may accept ours. 
So just ask yourself, we haven't got time to go into this, time is speeding by, but we did begin a bit late, didn't we? What are the areas where we're out of our depth as a culture today? One of them is, is actually gender. It's interesting, so many disputed questions revolve around gender and sexuality. And this is not because sexuality is of supreme moral importance. It isn't. Herbert McCabe wrote, so long as Christian morality is thought mainly to be about whether and when people should go to bed, no bishops are going to be crucified. And this is depressing. <laughs> not that we want our bishops present, of course, to be <laughs> crucified. But our society is in a real state of puzzlement about the nature of gender difference, the significance of being male and female. And here the church has got an ancient, wise, rich tradition, a Christian anthropology, but it can only grow and stay alive if we're in dialogue with people with whom we disagree about this, from whom we may learn. We have to attend to their experience, be drawn beyond our comfort zone. Otherwise, our theological tradition will wither. There'll be no genetic moment. It'll be dead. Or think of homosexuality. Oh, every major church is torn apart by this. When I arrived yesterday, I looked at the New York Times, a big row gang in the Mormons about it. Today it's the Methodists, or maybe it's the other way around. You see a real sense of puzzle. Do we dare to enter the debate as people who have something to say and something to learn? Or think of the nature of capitalism. Recent book by Tomo Piketty about how our present economic system is creating ever more radical inequalities in the world. This is creating enormous debate. We're having a debate uh, together with the Jesuits in Oxford, we're putting on. Are we able to get into the real crisis of capitalism? At this moment in our society, which it's a very difficult, complex question. But unless we're prepared to do this, and just like to sit back thinking that we know what we have to say, but we'll have nothing to say. And sometimes we have to live with truths that seem to be irreconcilable. How do you reconcile supporting marriage and welcoming the divorced and the remarried? We have to be patient as we find the way forward. Because the truth is one in God. And until we're fully taken up into God, we will endure moments of clinging to conflicting truths. And we may have little to say that we can say boldly. And that is sometimes for the best. William Hill, OP, who taught many of you, I know, said, God cannot do without the stammering ways in which we strive to give utterance to that word. But these hesitant words sometimes will have more authority than preachers who are boldly boiling over with conviction. Usually, loud conviction is in inverse proportion to actual confidence. And secondly, in words, in any real conversation, we're seeking new words. Sometimes you offer your words, sometimes you accept other people's, or you coin fresh ones. You never impose a vocabulary. You make it together. Augustine said, we are urged to sing a new song to the Lord, as new people who have learnt a new song. The new human, the new song, the new covenant, all belong to the one kingdom of God. So the new human will sing a new song. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus teaches a new vocabulary. But Pope Francis 
in Evangelii Gaudium, this newness is an inherent part of evangelization. He quotes St. Irenaeus, by his coming, Christ brought with him all newness. Every form of authentic evangelization is always new. That's the genetic moment. As we edge our way into a new vocabulary, T.S. Eliot in Little Gidding, last season's fruit is eaten and the full-filled beast shall kick the empty pail. For last year's words belong to last year's language and next year's words await another voice. So, to conclude very rapidly, how do we keep the conversation going? How do we balance the doubting and the confidence how do we go on talking when we have conflicting truths in our, mind, in our minds? And I would very briefly just say two things. First of all, by gesture, and secondly, by beauty. The disciples are filled with joy on the way to Emmaus, but they've no idea why. It's only a man, Emmaus, when he breaks the bread that their eyes are opened. It's what he did that makes sense of what they felt in a muddled way, their inexplicable joy. And I think gestures often point to intuited resolutions that we can't yet articulate. It's in a gesture that the necessity of death is reconciled with the freedom of the Son of God. Do you remember that extraordinary moment when Paul VI took off his Episcopal ring and he put it on the finger of Michael Ramsey, the Archbishop of Canterbury? What sense did it make? Was he recognizing Anglican orders? What was going on? It wasn't clear, but it was a gesture which is reaching out to a unity of truth that couldn't yet be stated. Pope Francis is a great man for gestures. You remember going to, to wash the feet of those uh, prisoners, including the Muslim woman? It raises all sorts of theological questions, but it pushes us forwards towards a truth whose coherence we can, we can barely glimpse. And finally, beauty. In his keynote address on evangelization in the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress this year, Robert Barron put beauty first. He said, people fear that doctrine is doctrinaire, that a moral vision is moralistic. Beauty has its own authority which draws us without threatening our freedom. The beauty will lure us to the good and the true. I think of people like the Orkney poet, George Mackay Brown. His biographer, Ron Ferguson, wrote that in beauty and literature, beauty and literature hooked him and reeled him in. It was what he saw as the beauty of the Christian doctrines of the incarnation and Christ's passion which made him a believer. Nowhere in all created literature, he said, not in Homer, not in Dante, not in Shakespeare, in Goethe, is there, as anyth is there anything of such awesome majesty and power as the drama of the passion? The imagination could never compass that. It must be true. Beauty, like gestures, points to a unity of truth that maybe we can't yet articulate. Sarah Coakley, she was at Harvard and she's now come to Cambridge in England. Sarah Coakley wrote, a, I thought, a brilliant book on sexuality, the doctrine of the Trinity, disciplines of prayer, the nature of gender. It's an extraordinary achievement. And for me, the most fascinating chapter was the one on the iconography of the Trinity. And she shows that most, most images of the Trinity 
either a tritheist, you've got three fat figures, you know, or else the Aryan, who've got the father, is obviously the boss. But there are those few ones where you see how the imagination is touched and drawn towards the truth beyond all words. He says, she says, the most successful do not attempt to describe what it is like Shea God, but rather stir the imagination, direct the will beyond the known towards the unknown, prompting symbolic hints half-guessed. As Paul Ricoeur said, the symbol gives rise to thought. So, I think evangelization is always rooted in conversation. Conversation with strangers who become friends. And sometimes with friends whom we discover to be strangers. But we should boldly share our doctrine and humbly learn. We've got to dare to get out of our depth, be forced to swim and have to beg for help. And then we should experience, surely, a bit of that hilaritas, that wild, ecstatic joy of God's grace, and discover his presence. Thank you very much.